God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So anybody, anybody watching the Olympics yet? I mean, it's been on for a couple of days, right? Probably not even a medal count to pay attention to yet at this point. But, you know, um, when I was growing up, we'd watch the Olympics in our home. You know, just, it was on all the time. But you know what happens as you're watching the Olympics, right? I mean, there's those people competing from countries that, quite honestly, I'm not really interested in or in sports that I'm not really interested in. Or, you know, after you see one slalom skier, you've seen pretty much all of them, except for the really good wipeouts, you know, or the, the luge run, or the figure skating, and, and those kind of things. But that's why instant replay is so great. Because you can leave the room, you can do other things, you can refill your pop or whatever, and then somebody who's still watching says, oh, you gotta come see this. You gotta come see the figure skater wipeout. You gotta come watch this and, and see that. And, and so then you all run back into the room and you watch the replay and see what happens. And, and so we just, you know, and it's that idea of you got to come back and see what just happened. Or, uh, you know, pitchers and catchers report this next week. Uh, Major League Baseball is going to be starting soon. Yes. I don't know what to do with myself without, anyway, I'm just kidding. But uh, looking forward to Major League Baseball starting soon and spring training and the whole thing. But, you know, nine innings is a long time. And, uh, and so we'll have the game on at home, but we'll be doing other things. And as we pass through and see the screen, it'll be like, oh, yeah, Chris Bryant just put one out of the park. Let's go all watch the, let's watch the replay and watch the rerun of it. And so then the phrase becomes in our family, you've got to come see this. You've got to come see it. And maybe you're not into sports. And maybe it's that, uh, you know, you like the picture of the cute cat on Facebook. And so you, you've got to come see this. And, and check it out and see what's happening. Or maybe you've got kids or grandkids that are doing something and, and so it's, you've got to come see. And that's the idea here, I think, in the transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain and he says, there's something you've got to see. There is something that you have got to see that I'm going to reveal to you. I'm going to give you a glimpse into something that will be beyond what you could have ever imagined and you've got to come see it. And so if you're taking notes following along, I've got five points for us uh, to consider, five thoughts really, as we consider the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And the first one is simply that, a glimpse of the divine. A glimpse of the divine. Jesus gives these three disciples a glimpse of His divinity. We read again from Mark, there He was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white wider than anyone in the world could bleach them. One of the other gospel writers says, and his face shone like the sun. So how are they describing? I mean, it's beyond words to describe it. Whiter than white and shining brighter than the sun. And what has happened in this moment is what was hidden has been revealed. What was hidden these years has been revealed. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, as you recall, that when Jesus took on this flesh and took on the form of a man. He became a servant and he kind of, he hid. He hid his glory and divinity. And now in the, on this mountaintop with these three watching, he gives them a glimpse of his divinity. I don't know about you, but I like uh, HGTV and uh, some of those home shows and things of that nature. I was watching one not too long ago. It was actually you could buy an island. That seems kind of crazy to me. Um, I guess your nearest neighbor seven miles away and that kind of, but whatever. But the one I really like the most is Fixer Upper. Fixer Upper with Chip and Joanna Gaines, that's just the one I like and I like the way they do their shows and um, how they uh, help people out. But what I really enjoy is how they go from the beginning where they take somebody around and they show them a few different houses to choose from and they say, well this house is going to cost this much to buy it, this much to fix it up. We think we can take it from what it looks like right now and make it look like something else. And then that, once that, those people make their decision, they don't see it again. Right? So Chip and Joanna, they've got all the crews and they're doing their thing. But the people who have bought this house are not allowed to go see it. That would kill me. I would want to check in daily. I'd want to go and see what the progress was and how things were looking and if it was really looking the way I thought it was going to look and what to expect. And, but no, they can't go check it out. And they do all the work until you get to that last day when that, they've finished all the construction, they've got it all set up and the couches and the flowers and the plates and everything's in place. And they have those great big walls of you know, fabric with the old picture, the picture of the old house is there on front. So now these people have been waiting 
waiting to see their new house. And they still can't see it. They're standing out at the curb, and they're looking at what it used to look like. And then they say this phrase, right? If you've watched it before. Are you ready to see your fixer-upper? Are you ready to have it revealed? And then they pull them apart. And there it is. And there's always cheers and usually some tears and it's just beyond what they could imagine and it's, wow, the big reveal. And Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and there's this gigantic reveal of who he is. Who he is, the Son of God revealed in his glory. And it is a glorious moment. It is beyond description. Jesus showing the disciples something that no other living person had seen. And they got to see him as he revealed himself. God, very God of very God. Light of light. Begotten, not made. Being of one substance with the Father. Jesus reveals this to these three. Glorious moment. Now Peter's response, not so glorious. Right? Not so glorious. He says he was frightened and he didn't know what to say. So he said something. And that really leads us into our second point where Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And so immediately Peter falls into one of his old patterns of doing. You have to do something now. And that's our second point, is that it's not about doing. It's not about doing. See, I went through and I was just looking at some of the Gospels and some of the instances where Peter had these moments where his pattern kind of showed up. And uh, I just want to share a few of them with you. See, the first thing we come to is, you know, Peter, after being called and following Jesus, he's going all, being taught by Jesus, experiencing different things. But then you all remember that story where the, Peter and the disciples are in the boat crossing the lake and there's wind and waves and storm and Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And Peter says, if it's really you, then tell me get out of the boat and I'll walk to you on the water. I've got to do something. I'm not just going to sit here. I need to do something and have you kind of prove to me who you are. But then we go on and as they're walking along and Jesus is teaching, he's talking to them about his upcoming death and that he would die on the cross for them and be raised from the dead. And this is where Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, you've got to stop talking like that. I'm going to rebuke you, Jesus, and stop talking about your death. And so Peter jumps in, starts doing something, and it, uh, not exactly, in fact, what does Jesus say? He says, get behind me, Satan. You're doing what's important to you instead of what's important to Christ. And that came only right after, right after Peter had said, you are the Christ, when Jesus had been saying, who, who do people say I am and who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you're the Christ, the Messiah. Of course, that wasn't Peter speaking. Jesus acknowledged that. It was the Father who, who revealed that to him. But Peter's still wrapped up in doing. We go a little further, and Jesus is talking about forgiveness. And the common practice was to forgive somebody three times. That was just kind of the expectation. And Peter, right, he steps forward and says, well, how about if we forgive him seven times? I mean, that's really kind of over the top, and boy, that would impress Jesus if... If Peter said, I'll forgive people seven times. And what does Jesus say? He says, 70 times seven. Don't even bother counting how many times you forgive. But Jesus, uh, Peter is still wrapped up in doing. And in fact, Peter comes to Jesus later and says, you know, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? We've left everything for you. When do we get something back? What are we going to earn? And then, of course, on that last night, the Last Supper, when Jesus says, somebody sitting at this table is going to betray me, Peter speaks up and boldly says, not me. In fact, I'll die with you. And then he denies him three times before morning. So Peter's got a little bit of a pattern going on, right? He says, I'm going to do something. And I think, you know, I think I can speculate a little bit as to what kind of motivated Peter in his heart. Because it seems like what he's saying is, look at me, Jesus. Look at what I'm doing. I'm significant because of what I'm doing and be significant because of what I'm doing for you, Jesus. And, uh, and so notice me. Pay attention to me. I think he's also saying when, they, when he voices, let's build some shelters here on top of the mountain, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I think, I think what Peter is saying is let's just stay here. 
Let's stay up here on the mountain, Jesus. This is incredible. And let's not go back down into the valley and let's not go back to where all those people are seeking you out to hurt you. And let's just, let's stay here. And I think maybe Peter's also saying, you know, I want your approval, Jesus. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep doing. I'll keep working at getting your approval. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Tell me what you want me to do and I'll work harder at it. And Jesus is saying, it's not about doing. It is not about doing. In fact, when it comes to salvation, there is nothing you can do. When it comes to your salvation, there is nothing you can do. But I think for us, it's a law point for a moment to ask what's the pattern we fall into, that pattern of doing, of trying to earn God's love, of trying to earn forgiveness, trying to prove something. Well, how do we fall into that trap? And Jesus says it's not about doing because He's the one. He's the one doing. So as I mentioned, it's a law point. It's an opportunity for us to look in the mirror and see that I am broken and there's nothing I can do about it. It's also a point, just like Peter, who saw Jesus in His glory and was frightened, it's an opportunity for us to say, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. The glorious one. And, as I mentioned, even though Peter responded with his pattern of uh, doing, it leads us to our second point. Our second point of what God says to Peter to stop doing, to stop talking, and listen. And that's our third point third point if you're following along it's uh it's a command mouths to be closed ears to be opened close the mouths and open the ears he said the cloud appeared and covered them and a voice came from the cloud this is my son whom i love listen to him as you recall we heard these words at jesus's baptism where after his baptism the sky opens up and the voice from heaven says this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And here he says, and listen to him. Quite often we get wrapped up in listening to ourselves or listening to those who we want to listen to. Tell us what we want to hear. And God says to these three, and I believe to us as well, listen to Jesus. Listen to what he has to say. But it struck me as I was thinking about listening then, because maybe we struggle with listening, knowing how to listen. And uh, I was able to come up with some tips for listening. The list is actually, there were 17 tips for listening. I'm not going to bore you with all 17 of them, but I found a few of them intriguing. And so here's the first one. First tip for listening. Understand that good listening is almost entirely about how you respond. What? Good listening is about how you respond? I thought we were supposed to be listening, not responding, not talking. But okay, maybe I'm just a little confused. We'll go on to point two. He says, think about how you would talk to a four-year-old and then talk that way when you're talking with an adult. Well, what does that mean, right? First of all, sounds kind of demeaning, but you're still talking when you're supposed to be listening. Okay, let's try another one. Number point, uh, next point is when you are responding, focus on something you can agree with. But again, I thought I was listening, not responding. In social situations, being a good listener means you're a good talker. I don't get this. The 17 tips for listening seems to be leading me into how to be a better talker. But I keep reading to find out what's next. And then it says, when the other person is talking, listen just long enough to get that key word so you can dive into what you want to talk about. Well, I do that already. I don't need a tip on that. It says, uh, if you, I like this one. This one's great. It says, if you can't relate to all the topics of conversation, borrow your friend's stories so you have something to say. <laughs> I'm still not seeing where listening is tied up in this. Last one says, learn how to interrupt with kindness. <laughs> but I'm still interrupting. I'm still not listening. Close mouths. Open ears. The Father says to Peter and the disciples, listen to Him. Listen to to what Jesus is going to tell you. Not only, I think, listening, but also seeing. Seeing Jesus. You heard him say that, right? Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with, him except, with them except Jesus. Jesus. 
Another Peter example is when he was walking on the water and his eyes were on Jesus, he stayed afloat. But as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus and he looks around at the wind and the waves and he kind of says, I shouldn't be here. This doesn't make sense. You don't walk on the water. What happened immediately? He sinks like a rock. Sinks like a rock. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. You know, if you were to talk to somebody about tunnel vision, if you were to talk about tunnel vision, they might say it's kind of a negative thing that having tunnel vision is not a great thing because it means you're just so focused in on one thing that's all you can see. You can't see other options. You can't pay attention to the circumstances or situations around you. It's just you're so focused on the one thing, you have tunnel vision. And so again, I hear people talk about that all the time and say it's kind of a negative thing. But what I have for us here, if Nolan can put those up, is just some pictures of some amazing tunnels. And watch what happens or, or experience when, when you start looking at this where do your eyes naturally go? To the end of the tunnel. You start looking at that light way down at the end of the tunnel. Let's go to the next one, Nolan. I like this one, right? The stained glass is right there at the end of all these pillars and everything, but I don't spend any time looking at the pillars. My eye directly goes, even with the vaulted ceilings and everything like that, I'm looking at what's at the end of the tunnel. A few more examples just to make the point. Here you have somebody there in the hallway. But I barely notice them because I'm drawn to what's at the end. This next picture, I could take a walk here for a long time. You know, just a long walk in the woods. But even there, even there, as I'm looking at that, I see some trees, leaves on the path. But right away, what's at the end? And this last one, this last one. Spectacular. Spectacular tunnel. And I want to look at what's at the end in the stained glass. My point for us here this morning is based on what Jesus Christ, I think, is teaching to his disciples. In fact, he's saying that tunnel vision can be a good thing. Tunnel vision can be a very good thing. And it's something that God grants to us. He grants to us this tunnel vision. If the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, had had this tunnel vision then it would have made the next days and weeks make sense. If their eyes had been focused on Jesus Christ, because as I mentioned in the introduction, this, this is a pivotal moment. It's just six days after Peter makes this confession about Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And it's right about six months until Jesus Christ is hung on the cross. And if they had had tunnel vision for Jesus, it would have made more sense to them what they saw next, they would have understood. But you know, we can't do this. We can't give ourselves tunnel vision. We can't just choose tunnel vision. This is something that's beyond you and me. It is truly a gift that is granted to us from God Himself to have tunnel vision. Peter, James, and John did not choose it. In fact, as you read it again, it says Peter and James and John were taken by Jesus Christ, led by Him up the mountain. And he transfigured before them. And then he brings them back down off the mountain. It is what Jesus did for them. They did not choose it, but he gave it to them. I cannot choose to have tunnel vision for Jesus. It is a gift granted by God himself. And so I just want to share with you something that I have been doing personally lately is I, I pray and I ask God simply, Give me tunnel vision for Jesus. Give me tunnel vision for Jesus. I pray it in the morning when I get up. I pray it when I'm getting distracted throughout the day. I pray it when I find myself falling into my old patterns. And I pray, God, give me tunnel vision for Jesus so that I see only Jesus. As mentioned before, this transfiguration is a huge reveal big time gigantic reveal of Jesus Christ and his glory but in just a short amount of time they will be let they will be heading into Jerusalem and there they will see Jesus differently they will see Jesus beaten and spit on they will see Jesus betrayed and wearing a crown of thorns and they will see Jesus carry his cross and be hung upon it they will go from this moment where Jesus Christ 
is beaming with brilliance to seeing him bathed in blood for them and for us. He says then, remember this day. That's what Jesus, I think, is saying to his disciples. Remember this day. I'm going to reference a, a scene from the Lord of the Rings where the two brothers, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, there's two brothers, Boromir and Faramir, and uh, their father was the gu guardian of the citadel. You know, the, and, and so they invent this moment where there was a, a pretty important battle, and the battle was won. They were victorious. And so now you have these two brothers kind of celebrating, celebrating this great victory, this glorious moment. And even in their celebration, their father comes to them and says, I have this mission for you to go on. And if you're again familiar with the story, it was to go meet with the council and talk about this one ring, this powerful one ring, and what they were going to do about it. And so Boromir gets ready to leave and go off. And he can recognize it. You can see it in the storyline. He knows that this is going to be challenging and demanding and require so very much of him. And you almost get the sense that he knows he's not returning. And he says to his younger brother, Faramir, he says, remember this day. Remember this day, this moment. Because you will need to remember this day when we reach another day in the future. I'm convinced that what Jesus was saying to his disciples in this moment, he's saying, you need to remember this day when we get to that other day. When we get to the day when Jesus Christ is hung on the cross, you're going to need to remember this day. And remember that it is the Son of God who is dying on the cross for you. He says to them as they were coming down the mountain, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. There will be a day in the future when you will need to remember this day. He was transfigured in this moment because in a few months he would be disfigured for them, disfigured for you. And so as, G, as, as God says to those disciples and says to us as well, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. I think this is what he wants you to hear him say. Your sins are forgiven because of who He is and what He's done. I think He wants you to hear Him say that you are His and that you are very precious to Him. You are so very precious to Him. And I think He wants to hear you say, hear Him say to you that you are delivered and that you are accepted because of Him who He is, and what He has done for you. As we travel this life, we will come to the conclusion that this is more than we can handle. This is more than we can bear. This life is more than we can handle, and our sins are more than we can bear. But Jesus says to you, I've got this. And Jesus says to you, I've got you. To God be the glory. Amen.